You know there has to be a better way to keep yourself absorbed, and sensory learning is the ticket. So if you want information to stick and stop feeling alarmed by how you currently forget information like it's in one ear and out the other, it's not your fault. And you can forgive your teachers for failing you because they didn't learn how to use their memory correctly either. They never got exercises or processes for adding sensory learning techniques to how they read and remember. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier inviting you to watch on to understand the value of sensory learning and how to put it to work in your life. I'll cover what it is, how it works, and how you can embrace it so everything connects and gets learned quickly, thoroughly, and with reliable permanence. How would I know? Well, it's not just because I've been researching, practicing, and teaching sensory learning for nearly a decade. It's also because these techniques saved my life at a time when my brain was so riddled with fog and confusion, I was ready to throw in the towel. But I started practicing sensory learning, wound up getting my PhD in record time, and creating the Magnetic Memory Method website to share these secrets with what has now become millions of people around the world. Your learning struggles may not be quite as dramatic as mine were, but everyone can benefit from adding all their senses to the learning process. It makes the learning process easier, much more fun, and extends how long you can remember everything from everyday information to rigorous and complex information for exams and work. So if you're ready to master sensory learning so you can learn faster, let's dig in. Sensory learning theory says that we learn better when we actively engage our senses. Sensory learning theory also recognizes that we don't all learn in the same way. Students may have a preferred sensory learning style. They may opt for one sense over another. These preferences may even change depending on the subject sometimes. When you hear people say, I need to see it or I can't follow a map, tell me which way to go. They are describing different ways of learning. Now, this is important. Just because you prefer one kind of learning style doesn't mean it's actually working for you as well as it could. That's why we need multi-sensory learning. We need challenges in order to grow, and we need to exercise the widest possible range of how we take information in, and all the more so as the volume and complexity of data grows over time. Well, as we grow in life, we develop well-worn pathways in the brain. If we learn about something by both looking at it and touching it, we give our brains two different ways to retrieve information about it later. We lay down a more complex network of neural connections, more pathways. It's as if we've created a map with many routes to the one destination. Does science back up the theory of sensory learners? Absolutely. Psychologists Shams and Seitz reviewed the literature about multisensory perception and concluded that it is likely that the human brain has evolved to develop, learn, and operate optimally in multisensory environments. Studies have shown that people remember a voice better if they can match a face to it, demonstrating how the senses of hearing and sight create better memories when they connect. The connection of the senses in the brain is called cross-modal interaction. There's also research that shows becoming bilingual using sensory learning has been shown to be great for lasting brain health. You can read more about it on my bilingualism post at magneticmemorymethod.com. Here's a simple exercise. How does mud taste? What does drifting on a cloud sound like? Weird questions, right? Actually, this is sensory play that helps structure tools that you can use while reading, listening to audiobooks, or learning from videos like this. For example, remember when I talked about cross-modal interaction? Don't worry if you don't. But if you wanted to remember that term, as I often do in watching videos, I wouldn't let it just pass me by. I would seize upon it by using sensory learning. First, notice the word cross in cross-modal. Isn't there a famous guy with long hair and a beard they put on a cross once upon a time? It might not be the most pleasant example, but I'm giving you something exaggerated to show you how dramatically well this can work. Imagine the feeling of hanging up there on that cross or the sounds of dragging one around. Maybe you even think of the tastes and smells related to the word cross. As for modal, that's kind of a tough one, but only at first glance. There's a guy named Mo in The Simpsons, a band called Depeche Mode, and the modes are well known to most musicians. 
you can hear Moe's voice if you know The Simpsons. Or maybe there's a Roman soldier blasting out a Depeche Mode song. What else can you think of? Moby Dick chomping down on a doll for Mo Doll? Whatever you choose, sensory learning takes place only if you feel the weight of the action. Hear it in the ears of your imagination and mentally absorb the words using every mental aspect of perception you possibly can. Now for interaction, you start to think about India and your favorite action movie star. But not just the images. Now you've got Tom Cruise playing the sitar. Learning and remembering cross-modal interaction suddenly becomes fun and easy. But you take it further. You imagine what it feels like to type the word into Google, and then you actually do it, reading more about the topic and continuing to let multi-sensory images flood your mind as you go. Research shows that this process is how kids learn. But does this sensory learning have to stop at early childhood? Absolutely not. So the question is, how do you foster multi-sensory learning at any age? Well, first of all, if you like learning experiences like this one, make sure to get subscribed, enable notifications, and leave me a comment in the discussion below. That's important because it helps me continue helping you by training the robots in our own multi-sensory way that humans still care about how to learn more and remember faster. And now, here are a few sensory learning activities. Good learners find ways to supplement everything they learn with multisensory thinking and experiences. The challenge is to choose activities that challenge you and suit the desired learning outcomes. Explore other mediums. For example, if you only like watching videos, you should consider adding on podcasts. Even if you don't like listening to them, spend the next 90 days following up at least a few of the videos you've learned from with pure audio. Take notes and really discipline yourself to use the cross-modal interaction type imagination I just shared with you when you come across key points. Likewise, if you're usually a podcast person, flip the switch and try watching some videos. I personally prefer listening to videos and usually close my eyes, but at least a few times a week I push myself to watch people speak, and every time I'm glad because there is so much nuance in gestures that you just don't get without seeing people speak. Choosing to deal with a medium that is outside of your consumption preference is a great way to extend your attention span, develop your concentration, and exercise your personal discipline. I also recommend that you always spend at least a little time listening and watching content in real time, not two times speed. This was a hard thing for me to do at first because I can focus and plow through tons of content, but I noticed that overall, speed consumption led more and more to not really thinking through what I was hearing or mentally engaging it in a multi-sensory way. It's been four years now since I stopped two times in audiobooks and most videos, and I feel like I've learned far more than the period between 2008 and 2016 when I consumed nearly everything recorded at double speed. It takes time and extra effort to study in real time and use multi-sensory learning, sure, but soon you'll be encouraged by how pushing yourself outside of your preferences boosts your creativity, enjoyment, and memory. Personal growth is easy when you get your ego out of the way and embrace the discomfort, which is more in your mind than anything else at the end of the day. And that's the conceptual sensation, something you definitely can use as a power if you train it. Otherwise, you wind up a slave to the concepts of pain and discomfort. And as you continue to read and listen to podcasts and watch videos, as weird as this suggestion may seem, see if you can't get other sensations involved, like touch. We learn about textures and develop problem-solving skills by manipulating objects. We develop fine motor skills and hand-eye coordination. This is where activities like the advanced note-taking and mind-mapping processes I've taught on this channel will really come in handy for you. They're incredibly tactile, and links for those videos are in the description for you. You can also combine your hands with vision by using flashcards, creating charts and diagrams, and where relevant, drawing movements or concepts you've learned about from lectures or demonstrations. Hearing. Through hearing, we learn language and how to label objects. We learn how the sounds we make can get attention. We learn the joy of using our voice. If you're learning something really difficult, you can help your brain understand and remember the topic by writing and singing songs or writing and telling stories about the concept, engaging in discussions, scripting and delivering an oral report, like I'm doing now. Then there's movement. 
Through movement, we learn to balance. We learn about personal space and coordination. We learn how gravity works on us. You can act or dance out ideas. And there's a great TEDx talk by memory expert and memory champion, Anastasia Woolmer, where she shows how dancing was used to memorize a series of numbers. So 100 digits of pi is just a short contemporary dance story of around 35 movements. In my head, it looks something like this. 3.141549265358973238246264338 shows how dancing was used to memorize a series of numbers. You can engage in role play, charades, or create costumes that help you imagine what a historical experience must have been like. Whether you struggle to learn or already feel solid on your feet, I urge everyone to bring learning back to the senses. And here's why I know it's so powerful. Back in high school, I had a math teacher who finally figured out how to make sense to me. Instead of talking about estimating costs when shopping, something I still try to avoid to this day, he talked about beer. Risky, I know, given the age of the class, but by the same token, this was Canada during an era when you could still call a spade a spade. This guy was a much more memorable teacher because he drew up sensations people my age could relate to, something risky and forbidden, something intoxicating we could remember and could easily imagine wanting more of. And this is how you can trick your own brain into learning faster and remembering more. If you want to lose that creeping feeling that you may be wasting your precious time because you can't remember, sensory learning is the new tool in your kit. I've shown you how to take simple terms and make them multi-sensory and introduce other experiential elements into the learning process. And with thanks to you and our channel members for the view, let me say if you're not a member yet and want extra perks, just go ahead and click the join button below this video on YouTube. And if you're new here and not ready to support this channel yet, make sure to hit subscribe, enable notifications, and give us the thumbs up so our robot overlords never forget the great multi-sensory memory tradition we've talked about today. Because in case you weren't aware, it's this kind of sensory learning that the ancients used to remember entire books in detail, to learn languages quickly, and absorb the formulas that allowed scientists to eventually understand the universe well enough to send cameras to the most distant planets of our solar system. And after you master this kind of learning for yourself, keeping in mind that the definition of mastery is practice without end, the next step towards the practice of mastering multisensory learning is to test yourself. This is called active recall, and it's as simple as getting out a journal and asking yourself, what have I remembered? Don't dive directly into the target information or try to force it. Think about the sensations. You'll notice how much more sticks and leaps to your memory when all of your senses are switched on. You'll start seeing better results, I'm sure. And when you're ready for more, I suggest you watch our mini masterclass on unusual note-taking techniques next.